Neglect is the most common form of child maltreatment. There are four types of neglect, emotional, physical, educational, and medical. These four types encompass a wide variety of maltreatment of children that can lead to lifelong issues. Physical and emotional are the two most common as they include things like abandonment by a parent, lack of affection, disregard for safety, spousal abuse in front of a child, among many more. Sadly, in today's case, there were three out of the four types of neglect inflicted on the infant. There are three basic things humans need to survive. Food, shelter, and clothes. Without just one of these, living becomes very difficult and can have a terrible outcome. Physical neglect is the failure to provide any one of these basic human necessities. Infants yearn for their parents' affection since the parents are the infant's whole world. Emotional neglect is when a parent fails to adequately respond to a child's emotional needs. The first year of a baby's life includes many doctor visits to monitor their growth and well-being. Medical neglect is the failure to provide or arrange for adequate medical care. Physical, emotional, and medical neglect all played a role in the suffering of an infant. In today's video, we will cover Cheyenne Harris, a 20-year-old, and her husband, Zachary Cohen, 28 years old who were both convicted for the death of their four-month-old son, Sterling Cohen. The baby was found in a swing in their Alta Vista, Iowa apartment. This is a tragic case of neglect to unimaginable lengths. Please note that while we show mostly Zachary talking, it's only because Cheyenne did not testify during her trial. It is not because she is any less at fault. Let's first look at the life of Zachary before Sterling's birth. Zachary was adopted by a stable family and grew up in a Mennonite community. Zachary only received an eighth grade education and chose to work instead. It wasn't long before he ran away from his family. He was excommunicated from the Mennonite community due to his drinking and smoking at age 16. Cheyenne and Zachary have substance abuse issues that developed in interesting ways. Allegedly, Zachary began using due to his job as a truck driver. He claims that he is required to stay up for long hours and he turned to methamphetamine to assist him in doing his job better. From this introduction, he forms an addiction that he has carried with him for over 10 years. Zachary claims that he was the one that introduced Cheyenne to the substance one day when he felt she was difficult to deal with. This led Cheyenne to become addicted as well. In addition to using recreational substances, she was mixing it with antidepressants. Cheyenne and Zachary have a two-year-old daughter, Nala, who they appear to adore. Cheyenne often posts Nala on her social media and shows intimate moments of their life. She seems to enjoy her little family dynamic and wants the world to know. Zachary also appears to be a doting father that cares for his daughter and has a good relationship with her. It is October 21st, 2016, and Cheyenne announces that she is having another baby. She is excited and is eager to find out the gender. Cheyenne is hoping for a boy this time. Friends and family congratulate her on her announcement. Nine months can come up on you quick, and it is May 1st, 2017, and Cheyenne gives birth to her son, Sterling. From the moment Sterling is born, there is a lack of regard for his well-being on his parents' part. Cheyenne gives birth to Sterling two weeks early and delivers him at the home of one of her friends. After the birth, Sterling is placed inside a bathtub which is where the grandmother finds Sterling later that day. His grandmother demands that Cheyenne take him to the hospital to get evaluated since he is a newborn and that he has not received any professional care. Cheyenne complies and both her and the baby's health are noted as satisfactory. Cheyenne's mom is involved in Sterling's life. She cares for him overnights on occasion to give Cheyenne breaks. The grandmother does not hesitate when Cheyenne asks for help with Sterling and is there to support her. Cheyenne's mom doesn't notice anything too out of the ordinary. However, she does note that Sterling does have a tendency for diaper rashes and isn't gaining weight as quickly as he is growing in height. She doesn't feel Sterling is unhealthy, but rather just not a chunky baby like his sister was. Cheyenne and Zachary do not appear to have the same relationship with Sterling as they do with their daughter. There are no pictures constantly being posted of Sterling on social media like Cheyenne had done with Nala. Cheyenne wanted a boy and was given a boy, so what is the problem? Why do both parents appear to have a lack of interest in their new son? Sterling looks very different from his sister and father. 
He has light skin and light-colored eyes. This raises suspicion among Zachary and his social circles. Sterling's birth starts to reveal cracks in Cheyenne and Zachary's relationship. In addition to the grandmother helping with Cheyenne's children, they also have a neighbor that babysits from time to time. The babysitter notices that Sterling has extreme diaper rashes to the point of his skin cracking. She also notes that the children are happy and eat well when she's around. Friends of Cheyenne and Zachary frequent the couple's apartment and never realize there was a newborn baby in one of the rooms. The friends never hear the baby cry or make any noise. It's not that Sterling isn't present at the apartment, Sterling is just in the other room. This is considered normal for the family, as seen by the fact that their daughter runs around the apartment playing with her toys, all while not ever acknowledging the fact that there is a baby in the home. Cheyenne claims that she kept Sterling in a room by himself to protect him from his two-year-old sister. She explains that her daughter Nala pushed over a swing one time, and she would throw toys in his direction. Allegedly, Nala is a very jealous child and would act out whenever Cheyenne gave anyone else attention. Due to Cheyenne's alleged fear for her baby, she kept Sterling in a room, lying in a swing, by himself, in the dark, in a corner facing the wall. This was her solution to keep her baby safe. She started doing this as early as the beginning of August, if not well before. Babies need stimulus and physical touch to develop properly. Sterling was never given this chance since he was isolated from the rest of the family. It is in the early morning hours of August 30th, 2017, and Zachary arrives home after a long night at work. He prepares a grilled cheese sandwich for himself, Cheyenne, and Nala. Nala and Cheyenne are awake so early because Nala has difficulty sleeping when her dad comes home at the crack of dawn. They all enjoy their grilled cheese for breakfast. The odd thing is that she is uncomfortable about what she gives her daughter for breakfast and the thought of being judged by the officer interviewing her. But she doesn't show any inkling of embarrassment or uncomfortability when she talks about her son's death. When your daughter set up in your room to watch a movie for all that. What did you feed her? Do you remember? Cookies. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you to Elate Apparel for sponsoring today's video. Watching true crime can be intense and suspenseful, and it's important to be comfortable while you're engrossed in the story. That's why Elate Casual Shorts are the perfect choice for your true crime binge sessions. The front and back panel have differing lengths to give you full coverage. The side slit adds a touch of style and breathability, so you can stay cool and comfortable even during the most gripping moments. And with two pockets, you can keep your phone, snacks, and other essentials within reach without having to get up and interrupt the flow of the story. So the next time you settle in for a wicked true crime marathon, make sure you're wearing a late casual shorts. You'll be able to fully immerse yourself in the story without having any distractions or discomfort. And you'll look great doing it. Simply use code 15 wicked at checkout to receive 15% off of your purchase of a late casual lounge shorts. That's 15 wicked and the link is in the description below. All right, back to the story. Zachary claims that Sterling slept a lot, which is not abnormal for an infant. What is abnormal is that Zachary would go days without interacting with or hearing anything from Sterling and attributed that all to the fact that Sterling was sleeping. As we know now, Zachary has been living with such horrible smells and somehow coped despite his weak stomach for almost two weeks. Zachary even admits to going into the room two days before Sterling's death to interact with him. This was the last day that Zachary saw Sterling alive. Zachary smells an odor in the room and he goes to get a diaper. It is unclear what interrupted him from going back in to change Sterling's diaper, other than the fact that this interaction may not have been true. Zachary somehow was in the room with Sterling two days before his death and didn't notice the flies swarming, the stiffness of the baby, or the putrid smell that was well beyond any typical diaper odor. August 30th arrives and Zachary wakes up to Cheyenne at the foot of his bed, ready to deliver the fate of their son. Note, Zachary looks in the jury's direction when answering most questions. He also tends to shake his head up and down. 
Zachary is taking those moments to reassure the jury that what he is saying is true and to make sure they are agreeing with his side of the story. Did you have any interaction with Sterling on August 29th, 2017? No, I didn't. How about? Uh, he was sleeping. After you got home on the morning of the 30th, what did you do? Uh, I um, played a game on my phone. It was a uh, jewel, and uh, I made a little bit of food because my daughter woke up and she was expressing to me that she was hungry. Did you hear Sterling at all in the morning hours of August 30th? I did not. About what time did you go to bed? Uh, around 6 a.m. What time roughly did you wake up? Uh, I was woken up at, uh, I figured it was 11 or something, but that was from a different phone. Um, it was around me. How were you woken up? Uh, she came into the foot of the bed there, and I was sleeping, and she dropped her knees and was crying hysterically, and kept saying, he's gone, he's gone. When you say she, who's she? Cheyenne. And you said she was crying hysterically? Yes. How do you know that she was crying? I assumed it was crying, she couldn't, she couldn't speak for a while, she was... She was distraught, and, uh, and I couldn't, I had to ask her quite a few times questions so she could actually answer that I could understand. When she was crying and upset, did she tell you what happened? She had said, he's, he's gone, he's gone, and uh, then uh, I asked, who's gone? And she said, Sterling. And what happened after she said, Sterling's gone? I jumped out of bed and ran to the bedroom there and, and, I, and looked at him and I noticed he wasn't moving so I touched right here and he was cold and I looked and I seen some blood out of his mouth that was a little bit of blood. At some point on the 30th you called 911, correct? Yes. About how long after you woke up until you called him? Uh, it took a little bit to call because in the office there's absolutely no service for Verizon phones, which we had. And so I was going back and forth to the apartment trying to get a signal. And then I couldn't find it in there. Went outside and was holding my phone up trying to get a signal. Her phone, I'm sorry. And uh, then I finally got one after uh, the shooter spoke to me. Were you smoking outside? I was. And why were you outside again? Trying to search for a signal. Was that the incident that the shooter said where she encountered you? Yes. After you found out that Sterling passed away, what were you feeling? It was uh, like someone punched me in the chest. I couldn't get air. I was in disbelief and shock. I would have called it shock. I and mean, the other people I have different conceptions of shock, but it was just, I was so lost. At any time did you uh, cry? I did in private. Why, why did you cry in private? Uh, because when people around me are emotional, I just, I want to be the one that is like, calm and collected so they don't feel like I'm losing control as well. After you've been interviewed by the police and your show was trying to pass away, what happened? What did you think it happened? I had thought it was kids because there was no, in my mind there was no explanation for why he would have passed away. There is a saying, one's perception is one's reality. Whether this was a disconnect in two people's perception or this was Zachary coming up with an excuse after the fact, either way, he does not seem too concerned given the fact that he was moseying around the property looking for signal and he had time to light a cigarette. Remember the neighbor who also babysat for the family on occasion? 
while she is one of the first people to find out about Sterling's fate. The babysitter is outside and runs into Zachary at arguably the worst possible time, right as he is supposedly looking for signal. And no, he never asked his neighbor to help call 911. In the following clip, we will hear the babysitter recall her interaction with Zachary, Sterling's father, and how she found out about Sterling's death. How did you learn that Sterling had died? Through Mr. Cohen outside. I went outside for a cigarette and he came out shortly from his apartment building and I had said hello and he was pacing back and forth on the sidewalk and he didn't respond so I walked over to him and I said what's going on I asked him what was wrong and he said he's gone he's just gone I'm like who's gone he's like my baby boy is gone he's just gone and he's smoking a cigarette outside and I'm like well is anybody coming did you call 911 and he's like, we don't know what to do at this point. I was like, well, don't you think you should get on the phone and call 911 and put that cigarette out kind of thing? And he then, you know, put a cigarette out and went in and called 911, I'm was, assuming. How long was it to, to the uh, first responders arrive? It seemed like 20 minutes, half hour. It seemed like a while. Deputy Jeremy McGrath was called to testify in court, and he recounts his experience as he entered the home. The environment was not something he has ever experienced during his time as an officer. An experience like this is traumatizing for officers as well. We will see him in the following clip clearly distraught about his experience, and we will hear firsthand how the home was when he was called onto the scene. The home was not typical, even down to the smells. Jeremy states that he smelled things he has never before, despite being around deceased bodies in the past. What did you observe and see? at the scene after trying to describe to you her thoughts? Um, I observed a infant um, in a swing and the uh, infant was cold and wet. Um, there was blood present on the infant's mouth and right hand, um, obviously deceased. When you say obviously deceased, what do you mean by that? Um, the baby was cold. I did, the farthest I went with the assessment was um, I touched the baby's forehead to visualize its eyes um, and I lifted his left arm and it was cold and stiff. When you say the arm was stiff, uh, in your training experience, what does that mean? Uh, rigor mortis. What is rigor mortis? Rigor mortis is a, a stage um, of death that a person's muscle goes through after dying. Is there a particular time frame that you usually see rigor mortis? From my experience, it's typically 12 to 24 hours. And it, it kind of depends on each case and the circumstances. You mean 12 to 24 hours after death? Correct. Did the baby have anything covering them? Yes, the baby had some blankets and clothing um, on his lap. What did the room feel like to you? Very warm. Did it feel different than the room that, that you had walked into originally? In yeah, absolutely, it was much warmer. Um, there was a bed in there that was laying up against the wall. Um, the swing was facing the wall in the opposite direction of the doorway. So as I walk in, I'm facing east, and the outside wall is ahead of me, and the swing was facing that outside wall. Was there any air circulation in the room? I didn't see any fans. Um, the only source of heat I noticed in the room was a baseboard heater, what appeared to be an electric heater. What did it smell like to you? Um, it was an odor that I don't recognize. And I've been on a considerable amount of death calls over my 17 years in EMS, and typically there's a distinct odor of somebody that has been deceased, and it didn't smell like that to me. I don't know if it was a, a urine, um, a urinish smell, but it's not a smell that I recognized. Something you hadn't encountered before? Correct. Tony Frederick, a medical professional in the intensive care unit of a child's hospital, was called to the scene as well. 
Upon arriving, she assessed the home and said it was in disarray. Tony, along with so many others in this case, have been traumatized by what they witnessed in the home that day. We will hear the struggle in her voice as she explains her experience when she entered the home. He took me inside, we walked in, and we went to the, we went to the back bedroom. <clears throat> he took me to the back bedroom, and it was dark, and it was stuffy, and there was a stench of urine there. I was looking for a crib, I couldn't see a crib. I said, where's the baby? And he said, in the swing. And, I, and it was dark, I said, we've got to get some lights on in here, turn the lights on. And he flipped the switch and the lights came on. And so then I um, went over so I could see Sterling, the baby, that's found out that's what his name was. And <clears throat> to to do my assessment, look, listen, and feel. Um, his eyes were fixed and dilated, staring straight out. Um, uh, he had blood around his mouth. And uh, I went to check a brachial pulse on him and his arm was stiff and rigid and cold. All of his extremities were cold. His little feet were cold. His hands were clenched in a fist and he wasn't breathing and his, his clothes were like crusty. When you, it, saw, when you saw Sterling, did you know that there was nothing you could do? Yeah, there's, you know, there's, there's no CPR. It, it's, you know, it just wasn't right. Was he in clothing or blankets? <clears throat> he had clothes on his, the clothes that was on his chest was crusty. He had a blanket that was draped over him that was wet. And when I, I, uh, when I brushed up against that, when I touched that, it was, there were bugs that flew from that. Dr. Timothy Huntington, a medical examiner, was asked to describe the state of Sterling based on the knowledge that flies were able to land and lay eggs. Dr. Huntington explains that in order for flies to feel comfortable enough to go through the reproductive process, there needs to be little to no movement around. He uses the example that if a fly is around you and you barely move, the fly will fly away in order to avoid danger. The fact that flies were able to lay eggs revealed that Sterling must not have been moved for long periods of time, if at all. We will hear Dr. Huntington explain the process that led to Sterling being infested. Sterling would have had to have had some mobility restrictions or almost moribund to the point where he's really not moving a whole lot. And if you think about, you know, a, a child kicking its legs or flailing its arms or you know, wiggling, because that's what babies do, um, that would generally be enough to keep flies from really spending much time there. Um, so it would, it would seem that he wasn't doing that. Once the flies had access to Sterling, what did they do? So the female flies are going to spend a little bit of time checking out the, the, the area. Um, so tasting or, or even feeding on um, the available tissues. And, and then they're going to start laying eggs. So one female scuttlefly will lay around 50 to 100 eggs. Um, that will create a, an attraction for other female flies to come in and lay eggs in the same area. Um, male flies may show up and virgin female flies may show up because it's a place for them to meet. Um, and so there's going to be a time period, um, minutes to hours before, once they gain access to once they actually start laying eggs. You know how long that process is? Uh, minutes to hours. Um, it, depends on the individual fly. 
And it sounds like once once eggs are laid by one fly, it's going to start attracting others. There's a yes, there's a pheromone attraction um, because there's a benefit for the maggots um, to be surrounded by other maggots. What happens after the eggs are laid? Once the fly eggs are laid, um, they're going to take a little bit of time for the eggs to hatch. Uh, once the eggs hatch, small maggots are going to crawl out of those eggs and immediately they're going to start feeding um, again on the, the feces um, and, and, and or body fluids that are going to be in the area. And as they feed, they're going to grow to that second stage. They'll shed their exoskeletons and, and progress through that that life cycle. I haven't had an infection from the diaper rash, the rot, and they had that raw skin. Could the maggots have been feeding on his body as well? Yes. Can you explain that? Scuttle flies are one of those flies that can eat a wide variety of things. Um, so certainly they will eat feces and rotting tissues of, of any kind. And so, um, in this case, while there's not a well-defined wound, like a, like a cut or a laceration or something like that, the skin sloughing off the body as it, as it was uh, would certainly be a food source that the maggots could use. Dr. Huntington concludes that Sterling was not changed, bathed, or even moved for about two weeks. It is stated that when Sterling was found, he had only been deceased for less than 24 hours. This means Sterling was left alive and rotting with an insect infestation for almost two weeks before he ultimately perished. Zachary Cohen, Sterling's father, testified during his trial. Zachary never changed a soiled diaper of either of his children. He claims that he has a very weak stomach when it comes to smells. This is particularly odd given the fact that we have heard from the officers and medical professionals that were on the scene explain the strong odors in the home. How is it that Zachary can't change a diaper due to almost throwing up, but he lived alongside a rotting infant? We will hear Zachary recount his experience leading up to Sterling's death. Sterling supposedly reached for his father, and Zachary admits to ignoring his desire to be tended to. Did you ever smell anything that came from Sterling or the inside of the I did. Um, earlier on, I went in there and uh, I noticed the smell and um, you know with my weak stomach I, I uh, asked about it and uh, did you ever find out what the smell was um I'm, I'm not sure if I can say it without objection well can I say I was informed well let me ask you this did you ever move any, any dirty diapers from the room I did and moved it back again. Did you notice any smells after that? Uh, yes, when I went in to check on him, when he had passed on. Was the door to the room where Sterling was at normally open or was it normally closed? It was normally open. Did you put any wax air pressures underneath Sterling's swing? I did not. Do you know how they got there? I do. How did they get there? Uh, we had a green sensi pot in the room and we had ran out of the cubes and uh, I asked her to uh, change up the scent a little bit so she went to the closet where we had some storage items and she had taken them out of the package right there and brought one cube over and she had a hard time putting things back where we belong. How did you interact with Sterling on that day? That was when he reached his hands up and you know, put my fingers in them and swung them around a little bit like that in his swing chair. Did you actually take him out of the chair? I did not. Did you notice any gas or that like bugs? No. The attorney starts asking pointed questions about Zachary's lack of supposed awareness of Sterling's condition. Zachary answers these questions based on what he recognizes was expected of him at the time. He goes on to say that he would have fed Sterling if he knew he hadn't eaten. Zachary is quick to put all responsibility onto Cheyenne and not take any accountability for the neglect of their infant. 
Zachary says that he trusts her judgment since their daughter has turned out so well. He is basically saying, well, if I trusted her and she failed our children, then she is the evil one. I was blindly following. It is worth noting that he does this in a relatively subtle way. Even though he does directly put the blame on Cheyenne, he doesn't badmouth her during his testimony. This is important because he would come across more evil and at fault if he sounded more aggressive toward her transgressions. The point is that by saying he trusted her makes it seem like he respects her decisions, but by putting all the responsibility on Cheyenne, he truly reveals his attempt to throw her under the bus to make himself seem better. Prosecution starts to reveal all the contradictions in Zachary's life, from him claiming that he has a weak stomach, but not having any urge to check on the source of the smell, to Zachary blaming everyone else for his problems, versus the care that he didn't give to his own son. The cross-examination that Zachary is experiencing is trapping him in his own transgression. Note that the moment Zachary takes a big sigh, he realizes that not only is the prosecutor trapping him, but he is now forced to reflect on his accountability. You have no explanation. I put my trust in the wrong person. And that's what you do wrong. I believe so, yes. Now, Leo is a dog, right? Yes. Did you care for Leo? I did. Dog has to be fed, right? Yes. Can't be himself. No. Dog has to get water, right? Yep. Can't get water for itself. No, it can't. Did you give that dog food? Yes. Did you give that dog water? I did. I assume you didn't want that dog using your apartment in the bathroom, right? Correct. Took the dog outside? Yes. Would you agree that you took better care of Leo than you did your own son? Um, the way it looks, yes. How would you explain that? Um, I put my trust in the wrong person. 
But you didn't trust her to take care of the dog? Not all the time, no. How would you explain to the jury that Nala was well taken care of? I don't know. At trial, a doctor testified who argued that Cheyenne was suffering from major postpartum depression and substance abuse in hopes to support the argument that Schilling's death was an accident. Yes, she was abusing drugs, and at first glance, it may seem like it had a big influence on her disregard for her baby. However, Cheyenne and her husband were both capable of caring for their dog and for their daughter for over a year. They have shown that despite their substance abuse, they are capable of being responsible for others, and that there is no true defense that Sterling's death was due to their addictions. And Cheyenne may have been ashamed of the possibility that she had a baby with someone else. Hence, she didn't post pictures of Sterling on her Facebook as much as she did with her daughter. These internal feelings could have led the parents to neglect their baby and treat him like he did not exist. The evidence presented in this case, including the medical examiner's report, shows that Sterling died from malnutrition, dehydration, and an E. coli infection. He had not been bathed for over a month and was found with maggots in his clothing and diaper. E. coli bacteria grew in the baby's diaper and his feces ate through his skin allowing the feces into his bloodstream, causing a severe infection. This is a disgusting example of a parent's neglect and disregard for their child's life. Sterling suffered a slow and painful death due to his parents' negligence. Zachary and Cheyenne were found guilty of first-degree murder and child endangerment resulting in death. Zachary and Cheyenne were both sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Cheyenne is in prison and gets into altercations with others frequently. Everyone knows what her crimes are, and child abuse is considered the worst type of crime in the eyes of other inmates. Cheyenne was interviewed about her time in prison and the interactions she had with other inmates. She made a comment that was directed directly towards my, my charge and why I'm here and... Yeah, I turned around and beat the shit out of her. What did she say that made you so angry? Um, she said, yeah, bitch, that's why you killed your son. Did you kill your son? No. The courts clearly thought that you were responsible. If I hadn't been high, I wouldn't, it never would have happened. I was not a good person when I was on meth and trying to be a mom. I wasn't. He was extremely neglected. Where did you find him? In his room in his swing. How long was he left alone for? Um, I can't say exactly sure how long he was left alone for. I think it was days. Yeah. It was days before I went in there. You're clearly um, struggling mentally. Do you imagine this is how you will go on to exist? I don't know. Other people here say that, that it gets better, that it won't be so hard. But in all reality, I think that's bullshit. Do you think you'll hurt for the rest of your life? Yeah, but I'll live. Do you want to live? Depends on the day. Do you think there was malicious intent? Or was this unintentional? Why do you think Sterling was neglected while his sister and the family pet were not? Thank you to our Patreons. We really appreciate your support. We want to give a big thank you to Dark Entries, Nexus, and Big Pepperoni Pizza. If you would like to get the uncensored and other content, feel free to join our Patreon today. Link in the description below. Thank you for watching and join us next time when we explore the psychological maze of some of the most wicked people.